In today's tutorial, we are going to be creating cash drops for your game inside of Roblox Studio. This can be used in tycoons, simulator games, fighting games, any other game that you think you'd use a cash drop in. This is what that can be used for. Let's start off by actually creating our cash drop. So I'm going to go over here and click on this part button right here. And we're going to insert a part. And then this part we can customize however we would like to. For me, I'm going to change the brick color over to a nice green color like this. And I'm going to make it roughly 8 studs by 8 studs and then 8 studs tall as well. This will make it a perfect cube just like this and it's quite a large cube. After we have our part created, let's go ahead and rename this one to cash drop. And then we can move this over to replicated storage as we no longer have a need for it inside the workspace. From there, let's go ahead and click on a brand new part. And these are going to be the spawns for where we want our part to be able to spawn. It's going to pick a random one of these spawns. So it doesn't really matter where you place them. Just as long as you have enough of them over your map for them to randomly spawn in a different direction each time. So I'm just going to resize this to make it more of a square like so. And then we can go ahead and simply move this and duplicate it wherever we would like to over our map. I'm just going to create probably four or five different spawns right here. And this should work out perfectly fine. So we have our different spawn locations here. You can spread these out however you'd like to across your map. And then from there, we simply need to select all of these different spawns and we can raise them up into the air. From there, I'm going to change the cast shadow property to false. We can set anchor to true by clicking on this button up here or by going down to the anchored property. I'm also going to turn off can collide for these parts and you can change the transparency up to one if you'd like to, but I'm going to leave them fully opaque for this tutorial. From there, now we have all these parts selected. Let's right click and press group as a folder. And this is going to create a folder for all of our parts to be inside of. And we can simply rename this one to spawns. Now, we have a spawns folder with all of our different spawns inside of it. We have our cash drop inside of replicated storage. So let's go over to server script service. Click on the plus icon and insert a script. And inside of this script, we're just going to start up here right at the top with a comment that I'm going to name services. I like to create comments like this to sort of separate different blocks of our code off because in my opinion, it makes the code so much easier to read and even to understand when you separate the different variables and functions in different parts of the script like this with comments. So right up here, let's work on getting the player service. So we're going to say local players will be equal to game colon get service players. Now the player service, if you don't know, if you look over in the Explorer, you'll notice a thing called players. Now this is a specific service. It's called a container service because it typically holds things inside of it. So let's go ahead and click on play. And you'll notice that inside of this player service, you'll see my player, Rusty Silly Band. However, in, for you, it should have your player here instead. And the player is responsible for holding all sorts of things like the player GUI, the player script, starter gear, the backpack, which is where all unequipped tools are held. And the player is often typically used to hold other points of data as well. So let's press stop real quick and go back to our script. And that is the player service. It holds all the different players inside of your game. Let's also, while we're here, get replicated storage, which is going to be equal to game get service replicated storage. Replicated storage is the service that we put our cash drop drop inside of. And you can really think of it sort of like a storage container or a storage area, sort of. Anything that you put inside of here will not be visible since it's not inside of the workspace. And it really is just for holding on to things. Let's go down a little bit. We're going to create another comment for our variables that are separate from services. So we're going to create a brand new variable. And this will be our cash drop right here. And this is going to be equal to replicated storage dot cash drop. Let's also go downwards. We're going to say local spawns will be equal to game dot workspace dot spawns colon get children. Get children is going to return an array or a table of all the items that are inside of the spawns folder right here. Which in this case are all of our different parts that we made a little earlier. And the cash drop variable, this is simply getting our cash drop part that we made inside of replicated storage a little while ago as well. So let's go downwards a little bit more and we're going to create a brand new comment for our functions this time. And this time we're going to create a while loop. So we're going to say while wait. I'm personally going to do 5 seconds for the sake of the tutorial, but you can probably put this up to 60 seconds 
maybe even 120 seconds. This is gonna be the time that you want to take in between a new cash drop being spawned. So let's start off inside of this while well loop. We're gonna say local clone will be equal to cash drop colon clone. What this is gonna do, it's going to create a one-to-one -one copy of our cash drop inside of replicated storage. However, whenever we clone an object, sure it does create an exact copy of that object, but the clone is actually parentless. It doesn't have a parent. So we need to set the parent of this clone. So before we do that, there are a few properties that we need to assign first off. We should also say clone.cframe will be equal to our spawns folder, not spawn, but spawns, which is our spawns folder and it's getting the children of that. So it's going to return an array right here. So we're getting that spawns array, which has all these parts in it right here. And we're gonna say square brackets, math.random, we're going to start off with the minimum number for the random number to be chosen. And then we need to pick the maximum number that it can go up to. So in this case, we're going to do the number of parts in this spawns table. And so it's pretty much going to pick a random number between one and the number of spawns. So in this case, we have five different spawns. It's going to choose one to five. And then whatever one it finds inside of there is going to pick that one. And then we can simply say dot C frame on the end because it's going to take whatever random part it found and then take that C frame and set that C frame to the clone right here. And now we will move the cash drop over to one of those random spawns. And then we can say clone dot parent will be equal to game dot workspace and that is good to go. So now every five seconds it should spawn a random cube on one of our spawns. So let's play the game real quick and let's wait five seconds. And you should notice, yep, it spawned on this part over here, and our cube dropped. After another five seconds, it's going to spawn another one over here. Another five seconds is going to go by, and it's going to spawn one over here now. So you can tell that this works perfectly fine. And back inside of our script, we need to actually make it so whenever we touch our part, we actually get cash from it. So we're going to say clone.touched, and we're going to connect a function to this with the parameter of hit, which was the other part that actually ended up touching our clone part. So in this case, it's going to be like the player's left foot or the player's left hand or whatever, whatever part is actually going to be that will touch this clone or this cache drop. So then we're going to check if hit.parent find first child humanoid, which is basically saying that if whatever it was that hit our clone part right here, happens to have a humanoid inside of it then we're going to continue on with our script and we're going to say local player will be equal to players colon get player from character and this is going to be hit dot parent because if hit was something like the left hand then hit dot parent would be wherever that left hand is located inside of which in this case would be the player's character and the player's character will also have a humanoid because every character has a humanoid because it determines things like the speed and the health and other things just like that. So every character needs to have a humanoid. Then we can get the player from that character, which was the hit.parent model right here. And we can simply check if it was a player that actually ended up touching our cash drop. Then we're going to say clone destroy so we can get that out of the way. And we are going to come back to this a little bit later. But for now, if you only want there to be one cash drop on the map at a time, we can simply check if game.workspace find first child cash drop, then we're going to say game.workspace find first child cash drop, and we can go ahead and destroy that cash drop before we go ahead and create a new one. However, this is completely optional, so you don't actually need to go ahead and do that. So this is going to work perfectly fine. Whenever we drop a brand new part, it's going to be able to be touched. And when we touch that one, it's going to be able to be destroyed. And we can test this out by clicking play and waiting a few seconds for our part to spawn in. So you'll notice we'll have a part over here. Let's wait for another one to spawn in just to make sure everything's still working. Yep. And we can go through and touch these and they will get destroyed, which is pretty cool. So let's go ahead and press stop. And one thing we need to do is go back into server script service. And it's always best for me, in my opinion, to create another leader stat script and a second script just to kind of keep everything nice and organized. However, you can do it in the scripts that we are working on. So we're going to say players dot player added, and we're going to connect a function with the parameter of player. And we're going to say local leader stats will be equal to instance dot new folder. 
and this leader stats folder or va variable that we have dot name will be equal to leader stats and then leader stats dot parent will be equal to player so that was a lot to take in at the moment the players dot player added event this is going to trigger whenever a player gets added to our player service and whenever that happens going to connect a function with the player that was added as the parameter now we then go ahead and create a brand new folder named leader stats that we parent to the player and you'll notice whenever we create a folder called leader stats with a lowercase l right here Roblox is going to automatically create a little leaderboard in the top right of our screen for the player and that's what is called the leader stats. Now something cool that happens with leader stats is that if we go ahead and create a value to go inside of our leader stats it will actually keep track of that value for us inside of that little leaderboard. So we're going to say local coins will equal to instance dot new. I'm going to create an integer value. There are two different types of number values. You have yourself a number value and then an integer value. An integer value is pretty much a whole number, something like one, two, three, four, and five, and etc. However, a number is more of a number that can be a decimal point as well. So this is going to be something like 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, etc. It can be like 40.5. It can be a decimal point pretty much. However, an integer value cannot do that. So if you do want to get, go into the decimal points, you can go ahead and create a number value. Otherwise, you can go ahead and create an integer value. It doesn't really matter all too much. Let's then go ahead and say coins.value will be equal to zero and then coins.name will be equal to coins with a capital C. And then last but not least, coins.parent will be equal to leader stats. So this is going to create a brand new value called coins set its value to zero, change its name to coin to the capital C, and then last but not least, going to parent it to our leader stats folder that we created over here. Now let's go down here, underneath our clone destroy right here. I'm gonna say player.leaderStats.coins.value will plus equal, and this can be a certain amount. So if you wanted a plus equal, let's say 200 coins for clicking this cash drop, you could do that. Could be a thousand coins if you'd like to. Otherwise, you can do math.random. We're going to do 100 coins all the way up to 1,000 coins. So this is going to plus equal our coins value by anywhere from 100 to 1,000 coins. Let's go ahead and press play now, and you'll see what we are talking about. So inside of our game, you'll notice we have this coins value right up here inside of the top right, and that's our leader stats working. If you actually click on the player service, open up your player right here, you'll notice that folder called leader stats right here, and it has our coins value inside of it. So if we were to press on this, you'll notice that we actually go ahead and get coins for clicking on our, well not clicking, but running into our cash drop right here. This is how you can make cash drops for your game inside of Roblox Studio. I really do appreciate you taking the time to watch this tutorial. I hope you learned something from it, and I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. I'm Rusty Suleiman, and I'll see you in the next tutorial. Mm -hmm.